So through a 65 watt gallium nitrate charger from AliExpress for about three dollars. Imagine that. My friend bought it and donated it to me to explore it, because this might be a little bit suspicious maybe. And over 30,000 people bought this. So really a lot of people have these at home now. I guess now there's time to test it. And let's also compare the weight of it to a charger I've tested, which can actually supply 65 watts. This proper charger is about 100 grams, and this one is 53 grams, so it's basically half of this one. Hell yes! Now let's take a look at the marking of it, the model number, the input is basically a universal mains voltage, and the output 9, 12 and 20 volts. What actually surprises me, it does not mention 5 volts. That's sort of weird, and it actually says the current for these voltages and for 9 volts it says 7.2 amps. That's really quite a lot of current. Are these ports even rated for this? Because typically these high power chargers to supply the full power, they can only do so at the higher voltages, so the current is lower. The lower the voltage, the more current is necessary to deliver this power. Let's plug in some USB tester and let's test it. Detecting PD none. The detection of most of the charging protocols actually fails here. Trying this USB-C port on it. Nothing. I guess it will be still detecting tomorrow. There's not much to detect. And the other USB-C port. There's basically nothing to detect on the USB-C ports and the USB-A port only seems to show 5 volts 0.5 amps here and 5 volts 1.5 amps here. And here's the voltage. It actually doesn't mention 5 volts, but it supplies 5 volts. Let's try to load it using my test load and see what happens. About 2 amps and the shut is down. And the USB-C port. The same thing. And the other one, again. And there seems to be absolutely no way of switching it to other voltages than just 5 volts. None of the ports can supply anything more. So it seems to be basically just 5 volts, 2 amps, 10 watts. Let's try to plug in the soldering iron. Voltage low, the other port. Voltage low. This actually requires at least 9 volts. If it can only get 5 volts, it says low voltage. I guess now there's time to open it. It's not super easy to open. And that's it. It's not super hard to open either. Let's pull the board out. What the hell is this? Seriously? A weight, another weight. What's that? Iron, 5 grams, 10 grams. This is Chinese 5 grams and Chinese 10 grams. So the actual thing without the weights is barely 40 grams. But now of course let's explore the board. There's a transformer, the main contacts, the fusible resistor limiting the inrush current, some auxiliary capacitor, the primary smoothing capacitor, some auxiliary film capacitor, the secondary capacitor, some interference suppression capacitor between the primary and secondary side, which is of course not a safety class Y1 capacitor, and here there is the bridge rectifier, couple resistors, a diode, the primary switching chip, the isolation distance is sort of kind of okay, this is the synchronous rectifier, replacing the secondary diode, couple of zero ohm jumpers, a resistor here, and that's basically it. And the ports, and you can see the USB port, the USB-A, as the data pins just connected with each other, they don't go anywhere, so there is no communication and it can't request higher voltages. And the USB-C ports on these boards, there's some resistor on the boards, and the USB-C ports actually go to some 6-pin chip, which could communicate with the load, but this is probably just the bare minimum to make the USB-C ports work. It's not to negotiate a higher voltage, because there is no optocoupler on the board. 
to request a higher voltage, this chip would have to somehow tell the primary chip to increase the duty cycle basically and increase the voltage at the output. But with no optocoupler, there is no way of communication here. This chip just can't tell this one to increase the voltage. And also, the secondary capacitor is just 10 volts. So this is definitely meant to supply 12 or 20 volts, as you can see. There is also absolutely no interference suppression, except this capacitor, which should be a safety capacitor because it's in a safety critical place between the primary and secondary side, but they used just an ordinary non-safety capacitor here. And this small electrolytic capacitor has a nice small drop of solder on it, for some reason. Nice. And here is the primary smoothing capacitor, 6.8 micro, which seems very low given it's promising 65 watts. The marking of the primary chip here. There's not much information about this chip on the internet except this example schematic. The primary side of the charger is almost exactly the same except this capacitor is non-existent and these two resistors are just one. And on the secondary side, instead of this diode here, there is a synchronous rectifier chip here. And of course some table here. It says the chip is up to 10.5 or 12 watts. Of course. Here is the synchronous rectifier. And again some example schematic, except that this pin 4 is actually going to the positive of this capacitor, and there is no such capacitor as this one. And the charger contains the A version, which seems to be intended for 5 volts to amps. And the tiny communication chip here. They should probably leave it running at its maximum current for a while and see what happens. After two hours no failure. And of course some thermal imaging. The box from the outside. And the internals. The transformer seems to be the hottest. And the secondary electrolytic capacitor. And the bottom of the board. The primary switching chip is the hottest. The synchronous rectifier. And so what's number diode is hot here. For the curious one is the secondary on an oscilloscope. It's running at 68 kilohertz. This is at full load. This seems to be a discontinuous conduction mode. Here the switching transistor in the primary switching chip is on. Here the secondary synchronous rectification chip is conducting. And here nothing's happening, just ringing. And gradually reducing the load. It seems to reduce the frequency. A constant on time, it seems. And almost no load. It reduces the on time only at very light loads. But now let's take a look inside of the transformer, which was the hottest part in this one. This time it wasn't the chip, like in the charger I opened before. You really have to have your fire extinguisher ready for these chargers. Let's explore the insulation in the transformer, because this is safety critical. Let's remove the tape. The core opens. A flyback switching power supply has an air gap in the middle. And here's the transformer with some tape over the windings. Let's remove this tape and see. This is probably the auxiliary winding. And it's actually close here to the secondary. And it's sort of slightly molten here. And the insulation is a bit questionable, but at least it's not touching. But if it keeps running very hot, the insulation might further melt here. Let's remove the auxiliary, which of course is on the primary side. 4, 5, 6, 12, 13. And the insulation under it. Typical two layers. Here's the secondary, which is made of several wires in parallel to reduce the skin effect. And the insulation under it seems to be acceptable now. And the secondary even keeps some distance from the ends of the primary here. One, two, three, four, five turns. The initialization under it seems intact. Two layers. And the primary here. 79, 80 turns. And the primary and auxiliary are 0 0.18 millimeters. And the secondary is three parallel wires, 0 0.3 millimeters each. So this thing is basically a 10 watt charger with weights in it, which of course could come off when you drop it or the double sided tape gets too hot or ages, and these weights can actually fall in and short the output with the mains. 
there is no interference in suppression, and the safety isn't really up to a European standard, and the capacitor between the primary and secondary side isn't a safety one, and really good chargers have a triple indulated safety indulated secondary wiring, basically. Even though, of course, I have seen much worse safety-wise. But nevertheless, the 65 watt rating is absolutely fake, and so are these voltages at the output. That's it, and if you like my videos, please consider supporting my channel on Patreon or using the thanks button, according to the value you received from my videos, and you can also subscribe, and big thanks to all of you who already support me.